Hi, I'm Carl Taylor. Welcome to Carl Taylor Live on social media. I have someone with me today. You do? Who are you? <laughs> Ashley. I worked here for a little while. Yes, Ashley is my first assistant, actually. So I've decided to drag Ashley into today's live show because we've got quite a few things to talk about. We're going to do our usual Q&A as yep, well. We've got it right? already. There you go. You've got the questions on oh, your yeah. side, haven't mm -hmm. you? I've got my laptop here. So we're going to do the usual Q&A. Ashley might even attempt to answer a question. Maybe if I'm 100% sure I know it. If you know the answer. <laughs> if you're going, if you go off track a little bit, I'll kind of guide it back in the right direction. Thank you. So Ashley's worked here for a couple of years. She's, uh, she, you do all sorts of stuff, don't you? You're our copywriter. You do some video editing, uh, but you also work with me regularly in the studio because you're uh, our, our first assistant on photo shoots because you've worked as a photographer as well, haven't you? Yeah. Little. So, uh, so she does know stuff about photography <laughs> and um, very good assistant as well. So I've dragged Ashley in today because I'm, you know what, I'm getting bored of doing these on my own. Yeah, I get lonely <laughs> sat here at this table, everyone constantly asking me questions and going on and on and on. Uh, plus, we're introducing you uh, with this new format chat show over on Carl Taylor Education, our more serious level yes. stuff. No joking there. No joke. <laughs> no, there is some joking there. Uh, so that's, a, that's, a, that's another chat show that's coming over on Carl Taylor Education. Right, so uh, what should we kick off with? I know, let's kick off with that box there that's next to you. Let's have a look at that. I just this ordered, one. and this has just arrived, um, this is the DJI Mavic 2 Pro, the Hasselblad camera edition. Now, I've lost the TV picture there. It's come back again. Right, there we are. Right, now this is the Hasselblad edition of the DJI, and this differs from the other Mavic 2 in that it's got a one-inch sensor camera and uh, the image quality from this, especially on the video, is meant to be superb. It also does 20 megapixel stills. Mm. I haven't bought it, though, for the stills. I've bought it because, as you know, I'm making this documentary. Yes, yeah. And I need some aerial capability. And guess what? Ben is going to teach me how to fly it. I hope he's a, a better teacher than flyer then. Yes. Well, what I've seen of his skills yes, are a you're, bit <laughs> you're right. Ben has had a tendency to crash the odd drone but he knows more about flying them than I do, and he's done some pretty good videos with them. And Ben, who's one of our cameramen, he's actually operating the live desk here at the moment. Um, he does a lot of our drone footage for our education channel programs. But as I'm making this uh, TV documentary thing, uh, I wanted a better um, filming capability, so I've opted uh, to get this one. Um, so I thought I'd save the unboxing because everyone loves unboxing. Now, you know why, right? I've got a theory about this whole unboxing. Do you know what the unboxing theory is? What? Why do people love seeing unboxing videos? Uh, I don't know. What, is it, what, what, what does unboxing stuff remind you of? Getting stuff at Christmas. Exactly. <laughs> That's what I think it is. I think it's like, get, look, it's, oh, it's got a lovely little seal on it. I think it's like getting stuff at Christmas. Right, here's a box. That's what it cut. Look, that's what you get. There's the drone. Look how small it is. Here, yeah, you hold that for a minute. Oh, so it's so light as there's well. There's the camera at the front, that little bubble. There's the camera. It's got a controller. Ben, is that the control? Is that got the controller with the built-in screen, or is that that's in that other kit? Right. So what I also bought was the. Um, open that one up if you can, Ash. If your fingernails are capable of doing. I'm going to have a proper good look at that later. Um, now, the reason I'm talking about this is because what I'm going to do, being a bit of a novice in the drone department, um, and I've got some obviously some in-house help here that can help me with this, but being a novice myself, I've decided I want to learn more about these because this may be useful for some aerial photography as well as my filming project. Um, so I thought I'll do a video diary of what it's like to learn to fly one of these and what it's capable of. And, the results we get, and I'm going to post those videos on our social media channel. So look out for that. What's in? The, what's that box called? What was that one called? It's this called is the this the is Fly More Kit for the Mavic the Two. The Fly More Kit. Now Two. this should have in it another controller. See what? See what's in there? Oh, that's batteries in that one. The, there should be a controller. Oh no, is that batteries? I don't know. See, I've never <laughs> not opened we'll it yet. We'll find out. Those later. are batteries. Oh, that might be. 
There's meant to be a kit in here, like they've got the new remote control with the screen built in it. So I, I went for that because I thought rather than trying to plug your phone on it every Actually, time, um, that doesn't look like strap. it either. Maybe that is it. I don't know. I can't tell. But we'll figure it all out later. Let's make a bit of space on the desk here. Right? <laughs> So anyway, so what I thought I'd do is I'm, I know a lot of people are into these drones and, and obviously it's a photography tool, it's a filming tool, a photography tool. So I thought I'd make a video diary of what it's like to learn to use these, how easy it is, how difficult it is, what the learning curve is, and also start to see the results that we get as a photographer, what I can do with this. I mean, you know, what I can plan. I've got some big plans for um, some hyperlapse videos, um, some cool different ideas I've got running through my brain on, I'm not even going to play, I'm going to let Ben <laughs> show me how to take it. I'll, I'll read, it. I'll read the instructions. Oh, this was the other thing. Do you know what this is that I bought? Do you I read bought? the instructions? I do actually. I'm a bit of a geeky nerd like that. <laughs> I bought these to go with it. Now, DJI didn't have these on their website. Do you know what these are? Looks like a monocle. <laughs> Looks like a monocle, right? These are graduated filters. You know the Lee filters we use on yeah, our cameras? Yeah like for landscape. Um, these are graduated filters that go on the drone. Where do they? Well, they clip over the lens. So you can see it's slightly graduated. I don't know if you can see it or not, but they've mm -hmm. got three different densities of graduated filters. What make was this? Do you remember, Ben, what make this was? Polar Pro. Who? Polar Pro, Polar Pro or something. Yeah. yeah. We, could, we, found, uh, we found these online on Amazon and basically a graduated filter, as you know, mm. cuts out the light at the top to darken the sky. Because one thing I notice with a lot of drone footage that we've been doing for our own stuff, and my mate's got one of these, is that sometimes, you know, this land looks nice and the scene looks good, but then the sky looks a yeah. bit washed out. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to get a set of graduated filters and actually use this for filming uh, how I would basically do my photography mm -hmm. as well. Right, now, let's move on, shall we? That's the bit about the drone out the way. We've got another toy to look at in a minute. <laughs> it's sort of turning into a tech show, isn't it? Like, People love that stuff. They love that, and they love all that tech stuff. Right, have we got any questions in? We do have a few, actually. Go on then, fire the first one okay. away. Okay, I think you just want me to try say these names that we've got coming in. That's true, it's always <laughs> difficult, always difficult. Abel Prinsel, I think that's how you say it, wants to know about leather shoes on a white background shoot, right. I'm guessing for e-commerce. Okay. Or I want to know about leather shoe, white background shoot for e-commerce. What does he want to know? He I don't know, say. well, what advice <laughs> would you have for shooting on white backgrounds? I suppose white, well, um, if it's a white shoe. Yeah, I mean, white, white, white backgrounds, the key, the key thing always with the white background is to make sure you don't push the white too far. We've got a, we just released a vlog on that, actually, yesterday, we did. I think. A, a blog post. A vlog. YouTube video. A vlog, yeah. But I don't think that goes into explaining about actually pure white backgrounds. That was more, that was the Chanel bottle yes. on, on the white surface. Now, you're right, that is a good little video we posted on YouTube yesterday. But no, when you're shooting uh, products on white, like pack shots and stuff like that, one of the key things is to make sure you do not push your whites too far. Otherwise, you end up getting washback flare around your product. So check your... Um, values, your RGB values in your software, and 255 in each channel means you've got pure white. So what I normally do is I set my values at about 250 in each channel, so it's just under mm -hmm. pure white. And then when you add your softbox lighting or whatever lighting to your product, in this case a shoe, a little bit of that extra light spills onto the background. That normally pushes the background just up to 255. And if you haven't quite got to 255, then you can turn your background lights up separately. But never, ever put your background lights up too powerful because you'll read 255, but they may actually be a stop over 255. Yeah. You wouldn't know about it. So I always set them slightly under. So there's a little tip. What have we got next? Next one is from a member of Carl Taylor Education. Mm -hmm. Christoph Zernick. Oh, that's, a good, that's, a, that's about as good as I would have said Saying, it. Hi, Carl. He, uh, they hope you're well. Do you have any tips for them photographing Hiver's yellow semi-matte plastic items? Uh, no, I, um, I did photograph some high-vis jackets. Uh, we, remember that MSA fire shoot we yes. did? And mm -hmm. they had all that high-vis fluorescent stuff on it. That did actually cause a bit of a problem. So the flash, studio flashlights mm -hmm. were bouncing off that quite aggressively. So I had to tone them down in post a little bit. And it really was just a post-production job because I couldn't change the lighting on them and on the product. So I just lowered the levels 
in um, in Photoshop on that particular color band because it's quite a narrow frequency band. It's a very specific green, fluorescent green. So I just had to deal with it in post. Um, if the actual whole thing you're photographing is that color, you may be able to draw the saturation down at the shooting stage if you're shooting tethered. Difficult one, I must admit. Uh, do you think there'd be any point in doing two exposures as well if it's really challenging? Or? If it's a still life, yeah. But obviously on those firemen, they're moving. Yes. They wouldn't, they wouldn't, we couldn't stuff them, those <laughs> firemen, unfortunately. Okay, so there we are. Okay, Martin right. Wace. Yep. When I do focus stacking with Photoshop CC, I so frequently get blurry patches. I usually shoot at least 10 images, depending on the object, in RAW. Mm -hmm. How can I get around this? Do you get the blurry patches too? I do. I do, Martin. Uh, it does often depend on the subject material, but like we shoot a lot of glasses and quite often wherever you've got, like say that's the product shot, where you've got something overlapping. Let me just get this the right angle to camera. If we did a focus stack, on that and the arms crossed over where the arms crossing over there you might get a blurry patch on the eye either side because it has difficulty determining you know the stuff that was behind it and the sort of blur that would have been behind that isn't there anymore that is on the, isn't on the front one and then is on the front one and then because of the magnification changes so i just have to go into the layers into the layer masks manually and find the appropriate layer and correct it myself. And if it doesn't quite work, I then find the shot, the actual layer that's got the bit that I need and I draw a bit out of it and make a new layer and I stick it at the top. And unfortunately, yeah, it is a problem. Sometimes if it's a very simple shape, you know, like that, where there's no overlapping things, it would take care of it. But when you've got like thin spindly things, they overlap. Mm -hmm. Focus stacking does seem to um, go a bit astray sometimes. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, it just got to put a bit more work in on it. What have we got next? Andrew Henning has a question relating to your use of our new drone. Will you be getting a proper commercial license? I think you might need it in some places if you're going to use it commercially. Yeah, Ben's got one. I don't need to worry about it. <laughs> so if, they got, if we've got to do it, if we've got to do it properly, I'll give it to him. Cool. Um, <laughs> David Martin is asking, are you planning any workshops in Miami, Florida? No, uh, unfortunately not. I'll tell you why. Um, we often get asked about doing workshops in different countries, but the workshops that we run, as you know, um, when they're run overseas, they're actually run by Hasselblad or Broncolor or a sponsor, Manfrotto or someone like that. And they're the people who organize the workshops because there's a lot of organizing, you know, you've got a is, yeah. studio, food, uh, lighting. Accommodation uh, if you're uh, doing that. Exactly. Yeah. Now I'm running one in Beijing with Tim Flack mm -hmm. in, uh, well not in Beijing, just outside Beijing. I think it's called Tianjin, Tianjin. Just outside Beijing, we're running our um, workshop that we ran here in mm -hmm. the studio where we did the horse photography and the product photography. We're running that one at the end of September, but someone in China is organizing the whole yeah. thing. Bron Color and Hasselblad are supporting it. So all the gears being supplied and everything else. So uh, what was his name? Sorry, that person. Mm, uh, David Martin. David. So the answer is David. I'm not against the idea of running one in Miami, but it's whether or not the, uh, whether there's someone in Miami who would organize it all and get the whole thing. And then obviously they've got to pay our fees because we, we, by the time we come to the workshop, we're going to get there a day early. We've got to At work, least. set it all mm -hmm. up and get everything ready and then jet lag and all the rest of it. Um, so it often comes down to just the whole organization issue and normally with Broncolor and Hasselblad and our partners like Manfrotto, they often set these things up and they take care of everything and we just fly out, do our bit, fly back again. Anyway, next question. Brian Stricker wants to know, hey guys, have you thought of a private Facebook group for members? He thinks it would be a cool way to share images to get feedback from others. Yeah, also, why, why are we stuff, looking at that? We have been looking at it. I know Emma's looking at it in depth as part of our, yeah. uh, something to offer members as well. So it's being looked at. Yeah, and obviously people are keen on the idea too. So it might be something that's coming. There you go. Maybe, so we'll have to see. That, that could be coming shortly. Uh, Pedro Messias. Hi, Carl. Do you often use polarized filters to shoot glasses or sunglasses? No, not very often. Um, I 
I don't know, this is weird today because I don't know whether to look at them <laughs> or to look at you because you're asking the question, but actually they're asking the question. So I'm not being rude. I'm going to answer to them and I'll look That's at you fine. now and again. Um, Pedro, was it? Yeah, Pedro. Yes. Um, I sometimes use polarizing filters on, the, on my camera for product photography, glossy plastics, um, for uh, packaging and things like that. Um, it's not often I use them on these type of products or sunglasses or anything like that because I generally am lighting the glossy plastic how I want it to go and I'm quite precise and controlled with it. Um, but there are occasions when I'm shooting packaging that might be a round package or something and it's not working quite well for me and I'll, I'll use a polarizer. As a matter of fact, we did that live pack shot show, didn't we, on Carl Taylor Education? Yeah. And I think I demonstrated using the polarizing filter on the Cadbury's chocolate yes. pot, mm -hmm. didn't I? I think we, so. We shot a few different pictures on that. Um, right. Um, anyway, right. Let's take a let's let's take a look at something else before we take. We're going to take yeah. plenty more questions. Don't worry. But I just want to I want to show people something here. Um, let's look at this image. Where's it gone? Have I shut it? I think I might have closed it. No, there it is. There. Let's take a look at this. This shot here is a Clinique product shot. Look at the lovely detail of this splash. Let me move my things out of the way. That's captured amazingly sharp with our uh, fast flash duration, bronze color lighting. And you assisted me on this shoot, Ash, didn't you? I did. I'm sure I was the one that threw that water. Yeah, on that <laughs> particular throw, that one may have been you. Because you know what? We were throwing so much water oh. over and over again at this shot. Go back to that sec, Ben. We were throwing, how many times did we throw water? Oh, we were here for a good afternoon, even more, weren't yeah, we? Yeah, we went into the next day. Yeah. yeah. So there was a number of complexities in that shot. Throwing the water, you were throwing water, and then you got bored throwing water. So then, I threw yeah. some water, and we saw how your timing was. And, and eventually, I knew when we got the one, we were, yeah, that's mm. the one. But then we obviously had to photograph. There were certain little tricks we had to do with photographing the Clinique label slightly differently. So they were on brand and things to do with that little bottle on the right there. That was done we're not separately. going to tell everything because we, we filmed the whole thing and we're releasing that as a new course next month, I think. Yes, isn't it? we yeah. are next month along um, with the post-production work, I think. Yeah, exactly right, along with the post-production work. But this leads me nicely into, because um, I've already put that picture up on my wonderful Squarespace website. And we have to say uh, this wonderful Squarespace website because Squarespace sponsor this episode and this show. So it is thanks to Squarespace that you're getting this live free Q&A today. And uh, I just wanted to say what a wonderful platform is. As a matter of fact, there you go. There's the Clinique shot. There you can see how quickly it loads in. You can see how easy it is uh, for me to load images onto my site. I literally, can dump pictures onto my Squarespace uh, website in batches into the right particular gallery that I want it to go in. Bang, 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 they're all done. They look perfectly sharp at any size, good for mobile, good for desktop. Uh, so easy for me to update my site. And here's another thing, look at this, right? We've had this problem again with these scammers, right? So look what I've set up there on the homepage. We are not looking for models. I brought this up on the live show recently mm. about people, there's someone trying to scam people, pretending they're Carl Taylor Photography, looking for models and asking models to do Skype interviews. T terribly bad practice and it's certainly not us. So I put that notice up yeah. so that the scammers can, you know, they, they see. So that's how quick and easy it is to update my Squarespace website. I can make these changes really quickly. Now, if you would like your own Squarespace website and you can get 10% discount on it, use the offer code CARL at checkout. That's CARL with a K, K-A-R-L. And you get two weeks free trial, I believe. And then if you decide you want to purchase, then you can use the offer code Carl. You get 10% off your Squarespace website. So we love Squarespace. Thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this episode. Let's take another question. Okay. Todd Woodward wants to know, where is a good place to get the black glass look for product photography? Okay, that's black acrylic. In uh, America, it's called Macrolon. Okay. Here in the United Kingdom of Great Britain, <laughs> It is called uh, Perspex or acrylic. Um, but in America, I believe it's called Macrolon. Now, uh, a Macrolon or Perspex, whatever you want to call it, comes in gloss black and it comes in matte black. 
and sometimes you can get it in gloss black on one side, matte black on the other. I normally go with the five millimeter or six millimeter thick one for my base surface. Um, and then if I'm using it as a vertical background, which I'm not very often, you can get it in three mil as well, but I prefer the rigid, uh, the rigid one. We also use the white opal acrylic uh, for lighting sometimes as well, as would have been demonstrated in our recent YouTube video on rings photography. Was, was it not rings? It was another one. I don't know, but we use acrylic. Yeah, quite we a use bit. acrylic mm, a lot. Yeah. yeah, so that's what it is. Uh, but Todd wants to know where does... Where could he get it? Oh, where does he get it? Yeah. Oh, you get it from any uh, sign manufacturing company. So people that deal in plastics, it's plastic. So sign service companies, people that make signs for buildings, office buildings, doors, uh, that sort of place, they use it all the time and you, they buy it in bulk, you can buy it from them. Um, or if you're buying loads of it, you can go directly to a plastic distributor and get it from them. Cool, then Dennis Stozik is saying, hi Carl, they're a subscriber of Carl Taylor Education. Hi, Dennis. They thank you for all uh, the knowledge that you've shared with them. Thank you for being a member, Dennis. <laughs> they want to know, uh, which Hasselblad would you recommend for using if you're starting with medium format? Well, that's a tricky one, because there's really only, I mean, you've got the X1D, which is the small mirrorless one, yep. which has got a 50 megapixel sensor in it. Then you've got the H5, uh, sorry, the H650, which has the same sensor as the X1D, but it takes the H lenses. Now the X1D can take the H lenses with the adapter and it can shoot tethered and it has got its own set of lenses. So if you're really on a budget, the X1D is actually a good starting point because you're literally getting the same image quality in a, but in a cheaper body. Um, but you haven't got all the modularity of the H system. I use the H6 100, which is also the CMOS sensor, like the other new ones, but it's 100 megapixel and the chip is physically larger. So those, that's the offering on, what, on new cameras, but obviously you could buy second hand as well. Yeah. So, I mean, you've got the H4, the H5, uh, there was a really lovely uh, H4 60 megapixel that I believe had the DELSA chip in it. They're all Sony chips now, but the, the DELSA chip was nice. But the older cameras, uh, are CCD chips, so they're not very good at high ISOs. You can't really push them beyond 200 ISO. They start to go mm -hmm. really grainy. They're good at 50, they're okay at 100. But the CMOS chips, the ones that are around now, the ones that are made by Sony, the baseline is 64 ISO and 100 ISO on the 100 and 100 on the 50. And you can push these things right up to 3,200 ISO and beyond with negligible problems, you know. As a matter of fact, I've shot commercial images at 800 ISO on the CMOS chip, and it's amazing. So in terms of versatility of ISO sensitivity, the CMOS new ones, but it's whether you go for the slightly smaller 50 megapixel chip, or if you prefer the physically larger and higher resolution 100 chip, um, that gets you a little bit more coverage on your lenses because the chip's bigger, but obviously more expensive. Yes, so yes. yeah, you gotta think about what you were wanting yeah. it for. Right. Good fella wants to know, hi Carl, do you have any tips for shooting through plexiglass. Often when I travel, I shoot cityscapes, but the best viewpoints often have plexiglass for safety reasons. Yes, okay. Um, plexiglass, funnily enough, is acrylic as well. Um, that's uh, macrolon, but it's the transparent one. Um, it, it's a tricky one because, you know, it's not just plexiglass. Sometimes you have to shoot through glass windows. Now, there is an accessory you can get that clips to your camera, and it's like a giant rubber sucker hood that you literally put on the front of your camera lens and then you put your camera up against the glass and you've created a black shield because the biggest problem is not so much the glass because usually the glass, if it's clean, it's pretty mm -hmm. clear and the perspex is plexiglass is clear. It's the reflection off the glass yeah. from the bright interior that, or your reflection yourself. So there's a sort of darkening shield that uh, some photographers use on glass. Uh, the next big problem is if the windows are dirty then you can't do anything about it because you're not about to climb around on the outside of the skyscraper and start cleaning it, are you? No. No. So I'm afraid that's all the advice I can offer. Uh, a polarising filter might work at a certain angle, but they don't work square on as well. So you're going to struggle. So I'd say you need to create some sort of big lens hood darkening thing so you don't get any reflections. Ali Corner is saying they're looking to buy a Wacom. What do you recommend? I recommend, I've got one here actually. <laughs> Let me get it. This is my Wacom tablet. And the reason I've got it on the floor is because we were using it on this table before. This is, what does that say without my glasses on? The Intuos 
medium. Where, where am I looking? Intuos, oh, Intuos Pro Medium. Intuos yes. Pro Medium size. Now I prefer the medium size. I don't like the large size, but this is the, the medium size and I find this a really nice size. Um, I'm left-handed and the good thing is there, it, see all the buttons here, they'd be a problem for me this way around because I end up rubbing over them and then they make stuff happen. So you can turn it around the other way and set it that way. It means I can use my right hand on the buttons if I want. You've got zoom features, programmable features. And do you know how much I use those? Never. I never <laughs> use those at all. I really just use the brush tool and the eraser tool and just do all my burning and dodging with the Wacom and it's an absolute essential tool for burning and dodging that's for sure couldn't live without it for that so uh, that's the one I use Paul Honecker is saying hi Carl you held a talk at Photokina 2018 and you said you were going to record it again and upload it to Carl Taylor Education is that still happening um, I was going to do that and then I got sidetracked with a billion other things as usual. Um, you know what, we were gonna turn it into an event um, and I was gonna get uh, a couple of other photographers involved as well to do it as a live event. It's still on the cards and I'd still like to do it, but um, I wanted to get these other photographers in because there were some certain key important issues that I wanted to cover to get across. And um, I thought it would be a good talk for the general audience wouldn't even be one on Carl Taylor education it would be a general social media one and I thought it would raise good awareness about certain aspects of photography that people often neglect or don't even care to consider a little bit like actually uh, let's just touch on this briefly um, Thursday night's live show on Carl Taylor education a guide to lighting emotion which was scheduled for it was scheduled week. for next week but I'm not here so we had to bring it forwards a week. This is our show on Thursday, six o'clock UK time, one o'clock New York time. Now this is a really important one and I'll tell you why, is we often get all these questions about gear, don't we? Which lens, yeah. which aperture, which this. But you know, that's kind of not the fundamental thing. You know, the most important thing about photography, do you know what it is? Does it start with an L? Start, it starts with, well, yes, but I'd say even, no, it starts with an E. Okay, emotion. Emotion, <laughs> exactly. Emotion is the most fundamental, important thing about photography. It's about delivering emotion in your pictures. A good photograph should do two things. It should deliver information and it should invoke emotion. Now, a good photograph can do one of those things. A really good photograph usually does both of those things. And part of the problem with photography in this age where everyone's sort of so focused on kit and gear is that they often overlook that fundamental fact about delivering information and invoking emotion. Mm -hmm. And on Thursday's live show, I'm going to go really deep into understanding what it means to deliver emotion in an image and how light can influence that emotion. I mean, we know, don't we, how, you know, l certain types of looks of light give a certain feeling, yeah. you know, it makes you feel mm -hmm. different. And I'm going to explain a little bit more about that. Now, the reason I bring this up is because in that talk that um, the gentleman mentioned at Photo Kino, I touched on it a little bit and I wanted to touch on it further, but I'm actually going into it quite deeply, looking at not my own, not just my own work, but other photographers' work, and I'm going to explain where some of this emotion comes from and how it's arrived at through lighting. So that's Thursday night on carltaylereducation.com. If forward you've not to it. checked out carltaylereducation.com already, <laughs> look at how big my head is. <laughs> When I do this, your head looks tiny now. Um, <laughs> on uh, carltaylereducation.com, Thursday night, join us. Hope you can be there. Another question. Tian or Tian Nicholas is saying, Carl, about your retouching videos, you seem to have loads of actions ready to use. What are they? Um, okay, we have uh, the most simple action I have is just an automated burn and dodge action. So rather than create a curves adjustment layer for my uh, brighter tones my, my dodge tones and the curves adjustment layer for my burn tones and then the layer masks that are needed to go with it uh, and all that gubbin setting up i've just got a button i can push um, so that i just basically i made an action recorded the action saved the action i've got a great new tutorial on how to make your own actions coming soon as well mm -hmm. uh, on our advanced photoshop course with victor fayash who's a professional retoucher from guild studios he runs guild studios um, he's got some complex actions that make solar curves for 
uh, identifying really small marks and any tiny imperfections in the image. Mm. He's got um, actions for creating um, black and white layers that allow you just to do your burn and dodge purely on tonal values. He's got whole tons of different actions for shine, for things. And they're all automated because he's already created the actions, recorded them, and then you just push the button and then all these things just pop up and all these layers and folders are already made for you. It saves you heaps of time. Those actions come for free with our courses. Yeah, they so, can be found in the download yeah, You can section. just download them and use them. Next question. Next one, uh, Scott Steinweiss. Would a Canon 5D be good for product shots being 50 megapixels? Yeah, I, I, I assume he's referring to the 5DS or 5DR, 5DSR. I think it is. 5DSR. Yeah, that's the one. Tim Flack uses one of those for some of his animal yeah. shots. So uh, Tim, like me, also uses a Hasselblad, but he also used uh, the, the 5D mm -hmm. SR, and, and he likes it a lot. I'd yeah. say it would be a very good camera for product photography. I don't, it wouldn't be an issue, but it's the lens. It's the lenses. Again. You're going to have to put a really good piece of glass on it. I, I use a focal length of around 100 millimeter and 80 millimeter on my medium format, which is equivalent to about 55 to 75 millimeter in 35 mil format. So most of my product photography is done in that focal range. So you're going to have to find a lens, whether it's an independent like a Zeiss one or some a really good quality prime lens in that focal length and uh, possibly a macro or a set of extension tubes. And you should be able to turn out some competent product work. Of course, I'm going to say it will not be as good as a medium format 100 megapixel Hasselblad because I don't believe it would, but it will be a, it'd be a close second. Get the lighting right and it should be a close second, yeah? Absolutely, the lighting is the key <laughs> thing, yeah. Okay, Oppo is asking, what do you think about Rico GR3? No idea. I know who Rico are. Rico are a camera manufacturer, but I, d I said earlier in this uh, thing, we are not a um, techie um, spec like gear. What, we're photographers here, aren't we? We're we photographers, we deliver information on lighting techniques, uh, fundamentals on photography, how to invoke emotion in your images. We deal with the art of photography, not the geek of photography. So I, I'm afraid I don't even know what that Rico camera is, so I cannot tell you what I think about it because I have no thoughts about it. Uh, hopefully you have maybe something on the next one. Okay. Pradeep Jayan is asking, among editing software, is Lightroom or Capture One best? Have um, you had much experience? Yeah, well, I've used both. I'd say Capture One is probably better, more versatile. I don't use Capture One because I use Focus, which yes. is the Hasselblad version of Capture One. And it's very similar. Capture One might have a few little extra features, um, but I think it's probably more versatile than Lightroom, especially if you're going to try and put a camera tethered and you want to shoot tethered. And Capture One, Lightroom, I find a bit clunky. I mean, Lightroom does a good job. We've shot with it, yeah, well, yeah for you our can food do courses it. and yeah. some of our live shows You can do it, well. but Capture One would be better. I th I sh we should do a course on Capture One. It's the one yeah. bit of software that we don't have a course on. Sorry, I got, Maybe people I can gonna, let us know if that's something them. they'd want. <laughs> right, go for it. Next one. Okay, How is saying, hello, Carl. In your Fashionscape series, you used a square polarizer on location. Are, mm. uh, are there any differences between that and a filter threaded polarizer? Uh, no, um, you've got two types. You mustn't get confused about um, linear and, and circular polarizers. The term circular polarizer does not refer to the fact that it screws in or that it's circular. It refers to the way that it polarizes light. Okay, so a linear polarizer polarizes the um, electromagnetic reflections in a different way to a circular polarizer. So a circular polarizer uses a spiral technique to remove the um, basically reflected version. So a polarizer essentially cuts out the wavelengths of reflected light off of mm -hmm. stuff. So gloss plastics, uh, glossy surfaces, water, doesn't cut it out off of metal, funnily enough, okay. um, bare metal, because the way the electromagnetic spectrum works, light that's reflected off bare metal can't be polarized, okay? Mm -hmm. The electrons or whatever are different. But uh, a circular polarizer just cuts it out in a slightly different way to a linear. They both do the same thing, and they'll both do it 
equally or almost as equally as effective. It's just that linear polarizers don't work very well with some cameras' autofocus systems or with some cameras' light meter systems. It makes the light meter go cuckoo and it makes the focus go cuckoo, whereas circular polarizers uh, generally work better with some camera autofocus system and light meter. It doesn't bother me in the slightest because I never use a light meter from the camera and I never <laughs> use autofocus, so I use linear polarizers mm. most of the time just because they're cheaper than circular polarizers. They're just as effective and I'm not worried about the, the, the autofocus thing anyway. So there we go. Next question is a really good question from yep. Royal Studios. They're cool. saying, bigging this one up, aren't you? Wait for it, wait for it. Right. Carl, please make a class on composition, or I don't know if they mean compositing or composition. No. I got excited, right. maybe I misread. Uh, yeah, you, you were hoping <laughs> to give a plug. I were hoping they were, you were saying hoping to compositing. Give a plug to this new <laughs> compositing course there. Look, uh, we have this new course coming up. Uh, I believe it's being released tomorrow. Tomorrow. Is it, it is. tomorrow? It is right. tomorrow. So this new course on compositing, compositing using Photoshop, where Victor uh, and I are just sitting next to him asking him silly questions, uh, he builds this image from one of my previous images and he builds it into a new fire image. We posted it on Instagram, didn't we, today? Where's, it? Where's our Instagram feed? As a matter of fact, let me, get, let me see if I can make this work on camera. So here's, here's our Instagram feed, and we put it on the Instagram, and if you slide it, there's the original shot, and then there's what Victor Comp did, it like, did the composite, okay? If you're not following us on Instagram already, there's the thing Why on screen. Not? <laughs> Why not are you not following us on Instagram? How many Instagram followers have we got now? We're up to 80.6 thousand. I've got to beat Tim Flack. He's on about 85,000, so I've got, to, I've got to get past him. <laughs> So there you go, guys. <laughs> I've got to get past <laughs> if him. If you're before, watching today. <laughs> before I see him in September, I need to get past him. Right, OK. Um, anyway, where were we? So okay. yeah, compositing. Well, but if Royal Studios is asking for a class on composition, Oh, if he's asking, that? No, it, well, that's going to come up on Thursday's live show. OK. We'll be talking about that. But composition is one of those things that I've got, I've got two minds about it. There are some aesthetic rules that you can follow. There are some reasons and th th there are things that we actually go really in depth on our workshop, but they, you know, they need four days of explaining to get into. But there are other reasons that cancel out some of those compositional reasons sometimes as well. Um, and it's a lot to do with emotion again. It's to do with narrative and emotion. Um, sometimes composition will certainly guide the eye, um, but in many ways, it's the way the content of the image and the way the lighting works uh, that guides the eye through the picture. And it's about just keeping the eye in the picture because that's the whole purpose is keeping the attention span of the viewer. If you lose that, then the photo is not successful. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it doesn't matter whether you apply the rule of thirds or you do this or you do that. People will leave a photograph for lots of reasons, not just because of composition. They'll leave it because it's uninteresting. It's of yeah. no interest to them. It's not their preferred subject matter. The lighting may be dull. The content may be dull. The narrative doesn't is too ambiguous, and, or, or maybe it's not ambiguous enough. There's lots and lots of reasons. So there are more powerful reasons to stay in a photograph than just composition. And we teach a lot of that stuff, especially on our workshop that. Um, Tim Flack and I run, which is more about the science and the human visual response to images. That workshop, by the way, is on next March again. You can find it on our, yeah. our website. We had a tremendous workshop on that one last time, didn't we? Really, yeah. really good. Right, anyway, enough for that. Next question. Uh, okay. Leonard Ngombo well Jr. You should have been able to say that because that is. sounds Ngongo. like a kind of African. Yeah. <laughs> You're from South Africa, aren't you? So you, 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 you know all that sort of, those sort of names. Uh, which one is the best model of lighting system suitable for photography? Well, you know I'm going to say Broncolor. <laughs> I mean, what else can I say? I use Broncolor. Um, okay, so I'm an ambassador for Broncolor. I use Broncolor. Broncolor, in my opinion, is the best lighting system. I've used Profoto. I've rented Profoto when I've been on assignment and I've not been able to get Bron. Profoto, very good. I've, prefer the different modifiers that Broncolor offers. Before I used Broncolor, I used Elinchrom, and Elinchrom have got some good modifiers and fairly good range of stuff, but their stuff started to get a bit tinny. The build quality started losing its way seven or eight years ago, and I, I left and I wanted faster flash durations. 
Bowens, are still, Bowens have made a comeback because they got bought out by Wex Photographic, I believe, who mm -hmm. now own Calumet. So Bowens, which was always known as a sort of good budget brand, they're back. Okay. So Bowens apparently are still available. Right, another one. Aaron Dam. Sorry, I didn't mean to Deb. shout that at you. <laughs> Getting excited. <laughs> uh, Aaron Dam Deb is saying uh, they want to know, is it mandata mandatory to use a macro lens for wristwatch photography? No, not at all. I never use a macro lens. Okay. I use um, my 80 millimeter focal length or my 100 millimeter focal length on medium format and I use an extension tube. Now that's uh, okay if you've got a really high quality prime lens that you're using, um, but I've noticed no difference between using the extension tube compared to using uh, the Hasselblad macro lens. As a matter of fact, for me, and, and no disrespect to Hasselblad because they make some amazing kit and I love working with their kit, but the 120 millimeter focal length for me puts me a little bit too far away from mm -hmm. my subject for product photography, so I don't use that. If they made a 90 millimeter macro lens, I reckon that could be right up my street, that would, but they don't. I would say you'd be a customer, but uh, could, you already yeah. are. <laughs> I've got quite a lot of their lenses, though, to be fair. Yeah. Right, aren't we going to stop, take a break from questions for just one second? Okay, I wanna, okay. I'm going to do our whole tech gadget thing, right? Now, everyone's going to think that people are just sending me stuff. They're not. I bought these as well. Do you know what these are? These are, oh, that's the wrong way up. These I bought because of my noisy kids. <laughs> these are noise cancelling headphones, right? Now, I didn't buy them just because of my noisy kids, right? I bought these because um, I've just uh, got a new TV and with the noisy kids and everything else, if there's too much noise going on, I thought, oh, I'm going to try these noise cancelling headphones. And also, I do quite a lot of travel on planes and stuff. Yeah. And you get that, you can't, you know, with those little ones that you put in your ears, you've got the noise of the plane going. And don't they make your ears sore they after do. a while as well? These are really comfortable. Now, these are the Sony... I think they're the MX300, they're the new ones. Uh, does it say on them? I can't uh, see. Maybe here? Maybe here? Yes, what does that say? Uh, I don't know, WH1000XM3. There you go, that's the model. Now, I had experienced only once in my life noise cancelling headphones. They were Boss uh, noise cancelling headphones when I was flying on a flight to uh, Shanghai. And they were really amazing, but these take it to a whole new level. Now, you've not experienced these before, right? No. <laughs> so I've decided to test these on Ashley today. And the perfect, you see I put that in the background there? Do you know what that is? That there? That is our studio fan. It's very noisy. Now, if you put these on, right, I'm gonna show, I'm gonna get the app working. These will cancel out the noise. All right, put those on your head. What headphones need an app? Hold on, uh, they, these do. You don't have to have the app. You can plug them in as you like as well. Right, so first of all, you've got to make sure you get them comfortable on your head. So put them on your head, right? And then you've got quite a small head, so you probably don't need to stretch them out. If they're what? too, <laughs> if they're too big, that might. No, that's fine. That's fine. Right now, it's I'm going. Very good that we're talking at this. I'm going, going to turn really them on, and and you'll all, you'll probably start to hear the noise cancelling effect take place in a second. But there's this app that comes with them. That was super weird. It like completely it, like changed, changed the, the sound. No, it's changed it, right? Now, um, just let me just make sure that this is working. I've got to get this uh, connecting to them. It probably won't connect now. But you can actually um, change. Why is it not doing it? It's, it's saying not connecting. I'm going to turn the Bluetooth on and off here a second. And let's try that again. Now, you can, you can control the headphones from the app. And then you can set the parameters of the noise cancelling so that you um, can... It says it's connected. Ah, there we go, right. Now, if I turn this off, you'll hear... There's a plane going overhead at the moment. You won't hear it. Oh, now yeah, you can yeah. hear it. Uh -huh. You see? <laughs> it's quite cool, isn't it? Right, now you That's can so actually... Weird. I'm going to optimise these as well because it optimises them for pressure. So it's going to do a little test first. And then I'm going to put that fan on and you'll see, you'll see where, how well it cancels. So it's just running through some tests where it tests the air pressure and the surrounding stuff and that the headphones are fitting well and all the rest of it. And uh, they're really good, good sound quality as well. Right, so that's finished. Right, now I'm going to turn it off. So oh, I'm turning it's so weird. There is literally it's no silent, noise. Isn't it? It's amazing. You get this perfect sorry. Right, so it's off at the moment. Right, I'm going to put this on. This is quite noisy.
Right, now I hope you guys should be able to hear that. Right, it's quite powerful this thing, look. Let's make, let's make is her hair moving? <laughs> yeah, right, so you can hear that. Yeah. Now, it should cancel most of it out. It does. Yeah. And then when you play your music, you can still hear your music. So if we play the music, Yeah, it's just music. So you get to hear it, just the music alone. It's amazing, amazing. <laughs> right, that's enough of using you as a human guinea pig for the noise cancelling headphones. But it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's nice, isn't it? Done for it's nice show. with the silence, isn't it? It's lovely. <laughs> so uh, anyway, so I was, I was very impressed with those. So you get really good, you get really good sound quality. And mm -hmm. um, no, Sony did not send those to me, unfortunately, for free. I bought those. Um, but I was so impressed with them, I thought I'd give them a mention on the show. Yeah, they're really comfortable as well, because often I find earphones just sit. Yes, like even, yeah. Even if they're over ear. You, they're very you still, light, these. Yeah. And do you know what? You see, the, the, this is, and you've probably seen uh, through my office window, when I do my Photoshop work, I'm always mm. listening to no my music. No wonder you can't hear us, now I understand. Exactly, now I won't hear a thing. Now, Ben, he's quite into his audio stuff as well. He's got, uh, what have you got, the Dr. Beats? The Beats Studio 3s and his sound quality, I think, is a tiny, tiny bit better. The sound quality of the music, very, very close. But his noise cancelling isn't as good as the mm -hmm. Sony. I reckon that's the best noise cancelling that there is out there at the moment. Anyway, right, just threw that in. You might have been interested in that. You might not. You might be thinking, I thought this was a photography Q&A. Yeah. But well, maybe know, people do video editing and they want to work video in editing, peace and quiet. Uh, no, they no. doing their Photoshop work. I'm sure people doing their Photoshop work yeah. like to listen to some tunes, get some inspiration. Right, uh, let's let's continue on. We got, we got some more questions. Samil Kavranoglu, <laughs> sorry, is saying, what do you think a new still life photographer should shoot as a portfolio, material, product, to improve their portfolio? A new still life shoot, uh, shooter. Well, I mean, it really depends on your market. You know, are you aiming to do this as a as a profession or as a business? Uh, if you're aiming to do it as a business, then you have to look at the market you're going to target. It's always about supply and demand. So wherever you're located, whatever your geographical demographical area is, whichever geographical area you're going to tackle look at the market say right who's manufacturing what in this area what type of businesses are likely to be my customers who's my competitors what uh, what's the quality of their work what sort of stuff are they shooting what's their pricing you have to understand the market okay it's irrelevant asking me what you should be shooting if you're going to do this as a business you have to think like a business person and you have to shoot what the business demands that's it simple as that so find out what, what it is that is likely to win you work in your area. So for example, take Melbourne, Melbourne, like Melbourne or Melbourne. We had, um, what's, what's, what? Ben, uh, ben Thomas. Thomas from Melbourne, uh, well, he lives mm -hmm. in Melbourne. He was on the show. I was talking to him about this. There used to be a big industry for car photography in Melbourne okay. because um, there was lots of varying uh, scenery. You had like coast, you had mountains, vineyards, all sorts. And you've obviously got a wine region there. So it's obvious that in Melbourne, for example, the obvious product photography still life to shoot would be cars and wine, mm -hmm. because that's what the market would demand. They did have some electronics companies there at one time, but they've gone now. Now, if you're working in uh, Silicon Valley, it's, it's, you know, and if, that, they, if their ad agencies are based nearby and they handle that, it's gonna be a lot of tech stuff. Now, obviously that's at the very top end, but you might be in some reasonable sized city or town and, and maybe nearby there's a lot of hotels or hospitality industry. There's maybe a call for interiors, architecture, food photography. It just depends on your market. Don't, you know, concentrate on what your supply and your demand is. If there's people that are manufacturing whiskey and gin nearby, then start shooting a lot of whiskey and gin shots and get those really good and then present those to those people. That's it. Common sense. Damien Vaya is saying, Hi Carl, how soon after a live show is it available as a Carl Taylor education video or on YouTube? It's, it's not on YouTube. It's never on YouTube because people pay <laughs> on Carl Taylor education as members 
to see it on Carl Taylor Education. It's very inexpensive, I must say, to join Carl Taylor Education monthly. And now we've got the yearly and two year plans with Some all the goodies. Cool stuff, yeah. X right colour checker cards, camera straps, lens, lens pouches. pouches, all these mm. other goodies you get on the longer term memberships. Uh, it's available immediately, the, the, literally within 10 minutes of the live show finishing, the replay is up. But the replay goes up with the uh, normal, normally with the test broadcast mm. bit of 20 minutes of silence with just pictures of the studio. So you can fast forward past that. But the very following day, we cut that bit off and, and repost it again. So, but it's there immediately. Yeah, so it is. So you can watch it immediately. <clears throat> now, do you notice that everyone's saying, hi, Carl? No one said hi, Ashley no, yet. It's fine. It's fine. Someone say hi, <laughs> Ashley, for God's sake. Right, Ashley, yeah, maybe they, maybe because I only said your name at the start. Maybe. So her name's I Ashley. I have like a name badge. Uh, how do you spell your name? I can't remember. A-S-H-L-E-I-G-H. Or Ash for short. Or Ash. Or my version, which we won't, we won't say maybe. I don't know, I've plenty of versions. <laughs> right. Good fella is saying, hi, Carl. I'm just going to insert a and Ashley there. Yeah. <laughs> what size quality do you recommend putting images on your Squarespace website? That's quite a good question. That actually. is a good question. I put my images on at 2,500 pixels on the longest edge. So 2,500 if they're portrait, 2,500 that way if they're landscape. And I just put a tiny little watermark in the corner with my name. 2,500 pixels in uh, print resolution would probably only be about a six to a five size that's how you know that this is an a4 piece of paper mm -hmm. in america that's called a us letter size but it's a little bit smaller so half of that is a5 and half of that would be a6 2500 pixels if someone stole it would mean that it's probably good enough to print it that okay. big mm -hmm. in a brochure uh, which is annoying yes uh, and we have to hope that people don't steal it the good thing though and I must put a shout out to you guys out there, the general public and mm. photography fans. The good things, you lot are very observant and you actually notify me when you see my images uh, being used illegally. And uh, it's, it's, uh, that's very helpful because I've actually bought a couple of companies to, to, to heal on mm -hmm. that. Yeah, uh, no, it is past. nice that people let us uh, know. So when people let us know if they see our pictures being used illegally. Uh, but you've got to, you've got to make the, the, the call really is you could put them on at a lower size, like 1200 pixels. But then the problem is most of my clients are art directors and advertising agents, and they're using 4K monitors now or 5K IMAX screens. If you've just got a little 1000 pixel image and it's blown up this big, it looks a bit rubbish. Mm. So I, I go for 2500 pixels, which still looks good on a 4K screen. Um, and I prefer going for that quality of the image uh, than I do rather than protection of a you know, copyright type thing. Yeah. Aquilino Paparo is saying, Hi Carl, can I use a Para 88 for beauty photos or is an Octobox 150 better? No, no, then neither's better over the other. An Octobox 150 will give you a softer, more milky look, less contouring. The Para 88 will give you a, a more of a beauty dish mm. effect. But you have to use, because the Para 88 is only like that diameter, you have to use it quite close to your model. So it, it, you use it as you would use a beauty dish over the front of your model at a 45 degree angle, as close as you can get it really, um, without the skin going too hot on the forehead. But then it's obviously bigger from the model's perspective and you put it in the softest position and then that will give you a really nice light. It does need sort of quite nice looking models, good skin uh, to use that slightly harder lighting. If you're photographing old, an older woman or, or, or whatever, then maybe the Octobox 150 would be the better choice if you're going from that front top 45 degree angle beauty position. But it does depend on the subject. But for me personally, I prefer the para lighting style because it gives a bit more bite to the images. As a matter of fact, if I bring up, I'll have a look here on my um, while, website. While you're getting that up, I yeah. think the paras as well, you can put a diffuser on front, so then they basically turn into a softbox anyway, that's which is quite That's a very good cool. point. Yeah, that's a very good point. You can put uh, the front diffuser on. They've got two thicknesses as well, one very weak one, so still some of the para lighting gets through, that parabolic style of lighting. Uh, but there's another thicker one that literally turns it into a round, big round softbox. So soft then you've box. actually got both. You've got the best of both modifier. worlds, yeah. Um, so I'm trying to look here. Uh, this is with a Para 133. Uh, so it's a slightly bigger one, but you can see that more aggressive lighting with the stronger shadows. You get more of a sort of three-dimensional look. Um, and then I thought I had an Octobox 
shot on here as well. This is also with the Para 80, uh, was that Para 80? Okay, I can't remember which Para that was. It might have even been the 222 from the front. But I use Paras for most of my beauty lighting stuff. Uh, occasionally soft boxes, um, but not that often. Um, but we do use the soft boxes, don't we, on business portraits or yes, yeah. those type of you know normal sort of people shots. Uh, and the Octobox 150 is a good all-round versatile light. The other thing is it's a hell of a lot cheaper. An Octobox 150 will set you back what a few hundred dollars. A Paro is probably going to cost you a thousand, two thousand dollars. I don't know what it is these days. Anyway, how are we doing mm -hmm. on questions? We've got many more. We've got quite a few. We've got quite a few to right, get I think through. we're going to have to, we're going to have to call it, a, a, we'll, we'll answer the questions that we've got remaining there on, on the list. Okay, next one is from Joe Tecopua. Well done. Hi, Carl from Townsville. What's the difference between a crop sensor and a full frame? So before you even start to answer that one, yep. we have a blog coming on that, which will answer everything. Oh, but really? You do, can you? Tell them. do you? Do you? On a, a camera buying guide, yeah, where okay. we go into depth on so, um, the difference between. He said he was from Townsville. Good day, mate. <laughs> <laughs> hope it's the same Townsville. I hope there's not a Townsville in America as well. But there is a Townsville in Australia, as I remember. Would the time difference allow Joe to be from Australia? Uh, possibly. Maybe. Don't know what it is now. Maybe he's not Townsville in Australia. <laughs> but um, the difference between the crops, it's just the sensor size. Mm -hmm. So a 35 mil full frame sensor is a full frame. It's the same size as 35 millimeter film was, which is 36 millimeters diagonal by 24 millimeters high. And um, that's the same size as a full frame 35 mil sensor. A crop sensor is just a slightly smaller sensor, sometimes referred to as an APS sensor size and uh, uses a different lens format to uh, become equivalent to the same as the other lenses. There's slight advantages and disadvantages with each system. But as Ashley just mentioned, she's just written an amazing blog post on that whole thing. Not only going with 35 mil, but, but medium format, medium as, format well, as well. Yeah. well. When's that blog post coming out? It should be coming out soon, um, and it will actually give quite a nice uh, illustration of the different sizes right. and what they are for each, there you each go. format. Look camera, out for so. that. Now, yeah. also, all of our blog stuff is free. So even yes. if you're not a member on Carl Taylor Education, check this out, right? Go to Carl Taylor Education, and you go over here, there's all our different genres. But if you go to this thing called Articles and Inspiration, and you click there, it takes you to all these wonderfully inspiring blog posts. Ashley's just written this one on, see, she's a fashion, uh, you're not a fashion photographer. No. <laughs> I said you're a fashion photographer. Uh, she's, it's because I say it about your fashion blog post. She's a photographer, so she writes, and she's a copywriter, so she writes all these things to do with photography for us. And uh, she's got these amazing blog posts. Uh, here's the latest one on fashion photography, another one on one of our workshops coming up, uh, different, but, it, it, there's loads of stuff on here, great tips, isn't there? Top product photography product tips. Product photography is a good yeah. one to read. That goes into detail about lighting as well and uh, how to create emotion with light, why it's so important. There you go, that's good. And then we've got uh, our competition winners, light meters, why I don't use them, how to focus stack in Photoshop. All these amazing blog posts are on, on here. They're all on carltaylereducation.com. Go to the article section and go to inspiration. That's where you'll find all these blog posts. And you've got this new blog post on crop sensors versus medium format versus 35 mil coming very soon. Mm -hmm. Now, just while we're on the page here, I just want to talk about photography competitions. Look, very soon, it's the closing date for our competition, Beautiful Light. Um, closing date, 27th of June. And we're giving away a Broncolor Cirrus lighting kit. What an amazing prize. Can you believe it? I really can't. That it's, is worth... It literally sounds too good to be true. It is too good to be true. <laughs> uh, thousands and thousands of dollars worth there of Broncolor lighting equipment free to the winner of our beautiful light competition. So you can find that in our competition section, which is over here down on just below the login page. Anyway, right, let's get through the rest of these questions, shall we? Okay. Habiba Afsal is asking, what is your opinion on Guru Shot? Never heard of it. Don't no. know what it is. Okay, Surin... Sorry, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not being difficult. I don't know what that is. No, I haven't heard of it either. Um, Surin Lama Tieng. Hi, Carl. You have been using filters for cutting harsh light on daylight fashion photography. Can you give details about it? Um, I wouldn't say I've been using it to cut harsh light. I've used ND filters on fashion images when I'm shooting 35 mil because I need to get the 
ambient light down to a low enough level that I can get my sync speed to work for flash. Because on a 35 mil camera, usually you can only sync up to 200th or 250th of a second. So if I'm using flash on location, and I've got still quite strong daylight, I've got to get that daylight down so I can get shutter speed to 250th. So sometimes I stick a ND, three-stop ND filter on. Sometimes I use a polarizing filter at the same time, or alternatively, just to deepen the blues in the sky um, when I'm shooting fashion. And sometimes I use a graduated filter to uh, darken the sky. So uh, again, like, well, oh, here's a great example. This shot here that we shot in Iceland. So this sky was nowhere near as dark as that. It, I made it look dark like that by putting a graduated filter on it. Then I underexposed the ambient light by shooting at a higher sync speed because this was on medium format. So I was probably shooting at like 800th of a second to darken the general scene down. But then I can punch as much flash in as I want, mm -hmm. which then brings the model out of the landscape. And that's exactly what I did. So those are the techniques that I use filters, sometimes to bring the sky down, sometimes just I use a higher sync speed or an ND filter to darken the scene and then punch my flash in and I can put as much flash in as I want to get the model back to the level. And then having that slightly underexposed background scene, but with the model at the correct exposure, just pops her out of the scene a bit more. Yes, makes for quite dramatic results sometimes. Yes. Um, next one is Ethan Davis. Hi, Carl. Do you think age and experience matter that much if your work is at a good level? Uh, well, what, 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 I'm old, aren't I? And experienced. Uh, what does what does he say? Are you having a go at me? <laughs> is he having a go at me? Maybe Ethan is a younger photographer Ethan, and is struggling. Are you having a go at me about my age and my experience, or are you saying that's a good thing? Um, I think I don't know to be honest. I mean, do you think? Do you think if you were talking to, let's not take portfolios into account here. Let's just say we had a very similar portfolio. If you were talking to a client's office and I was talking, who do you think? Do you think age would matter there? No, no. I, I, I actually, I'm going to be honest with you. The best photographers that I know, the the, the ones that produce the best work, they have more experience. Mm. But so that's because they've been doing they, it longer exactly. than they, they've had so, more time. So, you know, to you look at the skills. likes of like people like Jonathan Knowles, uh, who is a top product photographer, who's going to be a guest on our uh, talk show soon. He's like one of the world's top product photographers, in my opinion. Now, he's, he's no spring chicken uh, no more, I would imagine. Like me, I'm no spring chicken anymore. Although I still feel like a spring chicken because I still have lots of <laughs> energy and bounce, even though <laughs> I am now past 49. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 50 now. Can you believe it? Uh, I think maybe Daria is a good example. Daria, Daria. is a brilliant example. Yeah, and that's why young. I love Daria, because she got lots of energy. She mm. was 25 or 26. And no, she was 20, 20, yeah, 25. 25. I think. But she had the portfolio of a much more mature and experienced photographer. Daria Belakova, Russian fashion photographer. So it really depends. You know, some people just seem to have some amazing work very early on they get it they they seem to have a, a more maturity and natural ability to it uh i personally don't think my work uh, my in the last 10 years has been my best work so from 40 to 50. um it, it's everyone's different you know everyone's different tim flack he's no spring chicken either even though he looks young uh he he's no spring chicken and his his best work is probably the last 15 mm. 20 years you know i don't know i i each to their own, I would say, Ethan. So maybe experience matters more than age. It does. But then I suppose you couldn't say that Daria was that experienced, although she did start photography yeah, quite true. young. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe she was just very prolific with it and, yeah. and, and did a lot of it. OK, Iman Ibrahim Khalil is asking, I'm more of a natural light photographer. What's your advice to start my own studio? Right, uh, first you need a studio. <laughs> you need a bit of space if you want a studio. Um, now, I started in a really small studio, uh, not actually at first, my first studio pictures were in my dining room in my apartment. And then I moved into a sort of garage, double garage size studio, and then it gradually grew from there to this huge monstrous 4,000 square foot thing we've got now. But my very first studio was tiny, and I used to shoot even small electronic products for clients in that space. So you can work in a small studio. My first advice and tip for you 
is uh, you need to be able to blacken your studio out. If it's small, you need to be able to darken the walls. Now, I wouldn't advocate painting all the walls black and all the ceiling black because working in a pitch black studio is quite depressing. Um, it's like being in a dark room all day, uh, but it would give you the best results and control of light. However, you can put black drawstrings curtains along the walls and have some sort of black covering for the ceiling. It's actually handy to have a white ceiling as well, yeah. but you need to be able to cover it over because working in a small space, you need to control the light well. And in our course light source in the portrait section on Carl Taylor Education, we cover how to do all that in that course. So that's the first tip. The next tip is I think you need a minimum of three lights. Um, although we can do, we've done some amazing portrait work with one or two yeah. lights, I think for product work, if you started going into that side of things, like a bit of food photography and other stuff, you need a bit more control. So you need to be aiming more towards three lights um, from a commercial perspective. Cool. Um, next one is Suhail Suri asking, what's the payment structure at the top like? Do you take any amount up front or a 30 day policy after delivering images? This may <laughs> not be a common issue, but I struggle with this here in India. The first thing before I answer that question is you, you do much better on their names than I do. <laughs> well, I, I don't can, know. I could be I, butchering them and we don't even yeah, know. <laughs> I, I, wouldn't even know. I, I, I can't read the names very well. Um, the payment structure is um, my terms are 30 days payment. They don't pay up front. Um, if it's a new client, I suppose 20 years ago, if it was a new client, I didn't know much about them. I might ask for some money up front, uh, but I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't actually, yeah, I, I, w I don't worry about it now because the clients that I work for now, are the same clients that I've worked for for 15 or more years. So I know them and I work with them and we have a good relationship. There's no no problem there, that's not going to be an issue. Um, I suppose if you're at all concerned, uh, but I don't expect anyone will pay money up front. It's a bit like paying for your dinner in the restaurant up front when you haven't eaten it yet. Would it be worth asking for a deposit maybe? Yeah, but I don't like that either because the reason is, sometimes when you ask for a deposit, let's say you take 50% deposit, they might kind of think, well, you know what? I'm not going to pay the other half. Yeah, that's Whereas also Whereas if risk, they haven't yeah. paid you anything, then they, you, you, there's a little bit more of a guilt factor in that they, they owe you some money and they can't go, oh, I'm going to pay and you half. And they're ruthless and they just aren't going to pay you well, anything. Well, you know what? I had that once with a client and uh, he said, look, I, 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 this was years ago and he was trying it on and he said, I, I don't think these pictures are as good as I was expecting and they were absolutely perfect. And he was just trying it on and he said, um, I'll, I'll pay you half uh, and we'll call it a day. And I said, you know what? I'll keep the pictures and you don't pay me anything. And then all of a sudden, he wanted to pay the full price. Yeah. So there you go. So, um, you know, you can also can have a level of control over it in the sense that give them the low res images first, maybe the images that are only good for their website. Don't release the high res ones until they've paid the full bill if, you don't, if you're a bit uncertain about them. But normally you are hoping to, to establish relationships with decent clients that are going to pay the bills. So 30 day term is what I operate. Todd Woodward again is asking, sorry for the newbie question, but can you explain what a modeling lamp does and what do you generally use the silver umbrella for? Okay, Two a questions. modeling lamp is just a part of a studio light. I'm going to get a studio light. Um, the, the, this is all explained on carltaylereducation.com, by the way, Todd, very, very clearly. This is a studio light and in the studio light, let me take, I've still got the stand attached here. Let's get that, get rid of that. Inside the studio light, you can see there's a bulb in the middle. That's the modeling light. And then there's a flash tube as well. That ring is the tube, the flash. That's the burst of flash that comes out. The modeling light is just there so that you can see what you're doing. So you can see where your shadows are going and see what it looks like. Uh, what was the other question, Silver Broly? Yes. What did he want to know about that? Uh, what would you generally use it for? Uh, anything. We use silver brolly sometimes for fashion work if we were cheapskating it and didn't have a parabolic reflector. Silver brollies can be good on location because they're easy to set up and pop open if it's not windy. They're portable. Um, they're quite sparkly in the look. So, you know, again, it's more for fashion where you want to reveal a bit of texture, beauty type shots. I mean, you can do a lot of good stuff with mm. brollies. But you might want to consider a translucent white brolly as an alternative to use instead of a softbox. It's a budget way of a softbox. The difference with brollies is brollies like a silver brolly, you bounce light into it and the light bounces back out of it. There's a lot of spread with brollies, so a lot of the light energy is lost 
to the sides and out there where you don't want it lost. Whereas a parabolic reflector funnels that light forwards. You don't lose so much light energy. And the three-dimensionality of the light is better on a, on a parabola. You can get parabolic umbrellas as well. Um, all of this, Todd, is covered in depth for $19 a month on Carl Taylor Education. Go don't, check it don't out. Don't we even have a live show specifically on umbrellas coming up? We do. We have a live so, show yeah, on umbrellas. That's on your question. Yeah. We have a show just for you. Just on umbrellas. But we also already have a tutorial comparing umbrellas to softboxes. Yes, boxes on one of our past lives. Exactly. Live, no, well, we've got it in a live show in, and in a... And in light source. Yeah. yeah. So it's all there. It's Everything's there. Everything you need to know is there. <laughs> Right, keep going. I lost my place now in all the excitement. M.M. Shaggy is asking, for Broncolor Cirrus lights, are the power packs required or can they be plugged right into the wall? The Cirrus. The Cirrus lights. Broncolor Cirrus lights. Cirrus yeah. are self-contained monoblock lights. They're not pack lights. You can't plug them into a pack. You plug them straight into the wall or you use the lithium versions and they've got a battery and you just recharge the battery, you put the battery in the light and then you can take the light anywhere with you on location, shoot outdoors, you get about 400 or 800 flashes out of one of those lithium batteries uh, and then you can even use them in the studio as well and you just have to have a spare battery to recharge it. Or there's the Cirrus lights that only work by plugging them into the wall. The other type of lights, like the one I just showed here, that type of light has to go into a power pack, so they're a little bit different. Habib, Habiba Afzal is asking, are you willing to teach students photography? Well, that's what I we, don't know what we're doing. That's what, 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 do we, what do we do on carltaylereducation.com? That's what we do. Maybe, that's our main business is teaching students photography. We teach professional photographers. We teach students. We teach all sorts of people. Maybe they're asking, do you take people on, like no. myself, to no. just teach them? No, we Unless have, you're willing to No, we, to have, uh, we have five or six yeah. staff here in the studio, so we're fully staffed. We, uh, we have the odd university student comes in on work experience and we take some from the schools, um, but we normally get a bit overloaded with that. So uh, the answer is no, um, I'm afraid. Um, generally not, because, you know, the, one of the things with this thing is that the first people that sort of jump the queue in getting work experience is usually people I know or someone knows me who knows me. Mm -hmm. And then they say, oh, my so-and-so is doing la, la, la. And it's like, oh yeah, oh, oh yeah, okay, right. So we already have like a sort of backlog of yeah. work experience people. Anyway. Surin Lama is asking, Carl, do you use RA panel for retouching? No, I don't know what that is. No. Sorry. Uh, Jean or Jean Le Palm, maybe that's a French name. Where's the name? Jean Le Palm. Maybe, yeah. Wait. See, I don't speak French. Oui, c'est vrai, c'est Jean Le Palme. <laughs> Hi, Carl. In 2019, would you cold call and offer your services to potential clients? Many of us, when we start, we think clients come to us just because we are photographers, but it's not easy. Oui, bien sûr. Oui, well, Maybe they don't speak French at all. Oh, no? <laughs> uh, yes, I would. Um, I think you have to be realistic about photography. And this is, again, this is a big misconception between a lot of photographers. They think they're artists and they think that means they don't have to do any business. They don't need to operate in a business way. You need to operate your photography business just like any other business, whether it was a pizza restaurant, a garage, a building firm, whatever. You need to advertise, market yourself, call people, make appointments. You've got to do everything you can to stay in business. And not only that, you've got to do good work as well. So um, yes, cold calling. Uh, personally, I would send your work in either a postcard, printed format or brochures first. I used to send printed newsletters, postcards, brochures, portfolios out to ad agencies and then have couriers collect them again. And then I would then make a call so it wasn't so cold because I say, hey, did you get my portfolio that cost me like $500 to send you? And I want it back, by the way. Um, is there any chance I can come in and have a chat with you about it? Um, and then, you know, you try and open the door by getting some information to them first so that it wasn't a total cold call because people don't like cold calls. Um, but hopefully they liked what they saw. And then you, you, if you manage to get the name of the art director, uh, let's say it was Joe Bloggs, and Joe Bloggs saw your couple of postcards you sent him and thought, yeah, that's quite good. And you might get lucky one day because you might send in a postcard of exactly what they were looking for at that time. So you might send in some alcohol shots or food photography or architecture or whatever. And they go, oh, actually, we're looking for an architectural or we're looking for a such and such. And, and there's a bit of luck involved. Mm. 
but you have to pick up the phone as well because they'll just yeah. leave it on their desk. You know, we're all so busy now. Yeah, it's so easy exactly. to get things. And don't leave it too long because they'll leave it on their desk and it'll stay on their desk for a couple of weeks and then it will end up somewhere else in the bin. Mm. So and they'll forget who you are. So send it, call them within a week. Question for me now from Lionheart Production. Did House. they say hi, Ashley? <laughs> they did. Read that spelt, bit spelt, out. Spelt that's it a, wrong. That's but. the first time that's <laughs> happened on the new Ashley show. Very excited. Hi Ashley, I do a lot of videos and documentaries more than photography. Would your programs be of any benefit to me? Huge, they're a huge fan of you, but that's like a, uh, a side note. Thank you very much. <laughs> Don't worry, she'll probably, she'll probably be running this on her own soon. I, I, look, I can just go. I can go and have a cup of coffee. Right, go on, you answer that question all on your own. Uh, I'm going to put this to mic that, back. Uh, that I would have for Lionheart Production House is we do have a section that, <laughs> that covers a uh, video. Uh, video and filming so it would definitely be of use um, but more importantly though I think is the fact that again as we've been saying throughout the show is how important light is so even if you're doing video and documentaries light is very important and we can certainly teach you that absolutely but like I said we still do have uh, a video a, a section have, on, we have, on we film. Have a whole thing called movie making don't yes. we where we actually made a short film using Canon 35 mil cameras and stuff yes yes so, yes, we can help you, definitely. Uh, Next I, question. So, well, oh, just, oh, if, I, if I may add. Oh, I don't a, know. A lot, of, a lot of the, 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 you know, the, the, the fundamentals of video are very similar to stills photography. And, and, you know, video is very much about storytelling and using film as a medium to do that. But all of the concepts of lighting and composition and all of those things are very, very crucial to good filmmaking. And obviously, that's also what you learn a huge amount of on our platform. Next question is also for me. Dan wow. Hariga is saying, hi, Ashley. What camera would Carl recommend as a first medium format? So we kind of answered this earlier, didn't we? Yes. Uh, with people just saying if they were starting out with medium format. Oh, yeah, we did you, answer this. Recommend? I'm afraid we, we, we're running out of time, so we can't answer that. The, the, there are, In there's summary. The, there's, the, there's the Fuji, there's the Pentax. I use Hasselblad. There's the Hasselblad 50 megapixel. You could go for the older medium format, secondhand Hasselblads, like the H5, H460s. There's some great ones. I use the H6100. The H650s also good. There's a ton of stuff out there. But consider the lens choices as well. Consider which lenses you think you're going to need and the quality of the lenses. And I love the Hasselblad glass. Next one, Peter A. Scully is saying, Carl, this one's for you. How, how about the Okta 150 without the front panel? Yes, that's a good point, Peter. Um, I have used softboxes quite a lot, actually. Before I used Paras, I used softboxes. Take the front diffuser off, then you're left with the internal diffuser, but then you've got a little bit of a silver surround, so you get a little bit of mix of softbox and sparkly light. So yes, it can be very effective. A little bit harsher, a little bit more aggressive, but that can be just what you want sometimes on fashion and beauty shots. Okay, Roger Quinault. How do I get these free goodies with my long-term membership? Well, you have to join on a long-term membership plan. As so a you matter get it fact, with the one-year, two-year... Well, look, look, let's show him. Here we are, right? So if you go on Carl Taylor Education to our homepage and you say join today, you'll see what you get on our monthly plan and then our yearly plan and then on our two-year plan and then and our, our mentor, new, new mentor plan where we, you get certification and you get personal instruction as well. Those are our plans. Now, if you're on an existing plan, you can upgrade, can't yeah, you? Yeah, it's super easy. Super easy. Mm -hmm. So you go into your account settings and you say upgrade and you can upgrade to one of the new plans and then you can get the goodies that way. And obviously you'll be extending your membership, but it will give you a credit back. Yeah, so you don't have to pay the full price at all. It will credit back what you had on yeah. your previous year plan or two year plan. So there's your answer. Okay, uh, Leon Rechter is saying, hi Carl, can you create a video Rector, on- Rector, I think. Rector? I don't know, Re Rector. Leon. Leon, yeah. yeah. Hi Carl, can you create a video, how to shoot metallic objects like silverware, top down photography? Hmm. Um, so we have not top down, but you have the one of the kettle. We've got the yeah. rings as well, which again that's is in true. flat that, laid, that's but almost, those are very that's good examples. Top down. Um, yeah, so the rings is a great example of how to control the light, wrap around light for metallic objects. The kettle's a good one. I've got a really good video with Oz Wrecker 
um, on, I think it's on our education channel, but it's also on YouTube, where he photographed a cup, a knife and fork, or a spoon and a fork, a metallic one, on the black slate, and he showed how he lit that, and that was a really nice technique as well. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's a few bits out there. Cool. Maxine Rawlinson, who's a member of Carl Taylor Education. Hi, Maxine. Says, uh, I was hoping to shadow a professional photographer for a day in the hope of gaining valuable experience on a shoot. I've contacted several, but have been unsuccessful. Any advice for me on how to get in anywhere, please? Yeah, OK. It's a good question. It's very hard to get your foot in the door. Sometimes photographers offer an internship unpaid internships unfortunately um, because they like to get free workers your best way is just to make yourself more valuable so i always say to students who are looking for work or that, that you know make yourself more valuable um, if you can come in to a place and work as an assistant photographer but you've also got copywriting skills or another set of skills like video editing or whatever you make yourself more employable as did ashley here uh, when she joined us uh, some years ago. So if you make your, if you upskill yourself, so for me, for example, a, a, a photography assistant that knows their way around lighting and photography and understands lenses and gets this, gets that, does this, change by two and a third f-stops or whatever, but they can also do something else. So say, right, there you go, can you finish off some post-production cleanup work or get these images battery sized or make yourself more saleable, basically. So. Uh, if you've got other skills, put it on your resume and say, look, I'm not, you know, I know what you're saying though, Maxine, you're saying I, you're just wanting to get the experience. So obviously I would hope that some photographer would be kind enough if you're just wanting a day or two here and there just to sit in and learn is that they might let you do that. But if you say, look, I'm happy to help out with this or do that and I'm not looking for the pay if it's just a day or two experience, I can't see why they would say no. I, I can't remember exactly who it was. I think it might have been... Uh, Tom on our live talk shows but perseverance was another thing yeah I think he was saying he was working on shoots and someone had approached him and he said look he doesn't need help he doesn't need help and this person kept showing up kept showing up and one day he actually needed some help and was like oh there you so go there you so go. maybe just, just persevere yeah exactly yeah so they might say no first time but it doesn't mean so you know it might just been bad timing yeah yeah is that it that's it well went on a bit there that was your <laughs> first session when I'm we went well no, over an hour session. there well, we just got you good. You got some practice in. Look. I did. So, yeah. how was that for you? All right. That was good. Yeah, good. I enjoyed Excellent. that. Those those headphones. Yeah, are good. Was, <laughs> uh, those headphones are great. You're not going to steal those off me, by the way. Um, right, great. Well, thank you very much for watching. Uh, as I say, CarlTaylorEducation.com. We have an amazing live show on Thursday, looking at the emotion of lighting and using emotion in our images. And uh, if you're if you've not experienced CarlTaylorEducation.com, you get way more than these social media sessions. So head over there, and we'll see you next time. Bye for now.